Okay, now I'm going to go through paper four, which is the extended theory paper, and that's for IGCSE Biology, and that's Cambridge International Examination, CIE, and October, November 2018, variant one, so the code is 0610-41. All right, let's get started. Let's get started. Question one. Figure 1.1 shows a pyramid of biomass and part of the carbon cycle. So we have our pyramid here, and so this is our pyramid, and the pyramid of biomass, and everything outside of the pyramid is, is the carbon cycle. All right, question A1. State the principal source of energy required for trophic level D of the pyramid of biomass in figure 1.1. So trophic level D, that is this one right here, that's the biggest one. Those are the producers, so those need get their energy from sunlight. So sunlight. Okay, state the letter that re represents the primary consumers in figure 1.1. Okay, so D is the producers. C are the primary consumers that, that feed on the producers. Okay, so C. And three, state how carbon is transferred from producers to primary consumers. Okay, so energy is transferred from producers to primary consumers because the primary consumers eat the, the plants. Okay, so that is ingestion. All right, four, explain why trophic level A is smaller than trophic level B in the pyramid of biomass in figure 1.1. Okay, trophic level A is smaller than trophic level B because we're talking about a pyramid of biomass. Remember, there's nothing to do with numbers of organisms. This is just the mass, the dry weight of the organisms in the level. Okay, and the reason why is because only about 10% of the energy that is in trophic level B will transfer to trophic level A. Okay, so the available energy decreases as you go up the trophic levels. So only about 10% of energy from one trophic level is transferred to the next. So the available energy decreases up the trophic levels. And the reason why most of the energy doesn't make it to the next is because energy is lost due to lots of different things. So heat, movement, respiration, excretion, many, many different processes. So the energy is lost as heat, movement, respiration, excretion, etc. Okay, another reason why is because not all the animals or organisms in one trophic level are going to be eaten by the next trophic level. So some of those some of the energy is passed on to decomposers. So not all the organisms or parts of an organism are, are eaten by the next trophic level, so some of the energy is passed to decomposers. Alright. B. Some fungi and bacteria are decomposers. Define the term decomposer. Okay, so a decomposer, decomposer is an organism that gets its energy from dead organic material. So organisms that get energy from dead organic material. Two, arrow X on figure 1.1 indicates the transfer of carbon from decomposers to the atmosphere. Name the process of X. All right. Okay, so at every single level, what... Uh, some of the organisms are not eaten by the next level and they get eaten by or broken down by the decomposers. And then those decomposers somehow produce CO2 into the atmosphere. Okay, that process is known as respiration. All right. Okay, that's respiration. C. Describe how human activities are affecting the carbon cycle. Okay, this is a pretty long question. Okay, there's lots of things you can put down here. Well, one that's very obvious is humans are burning fossil fuels. So as fossil fuels are being burned, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere increases because combustion releases carbon dioxide. So humans are burning more fossil fuels, so the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere is increasing. Another thing humans doing are cutting down trees and trees remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere during photosynthesis and put oxygen in. So humans cut down forests known as deforestation and they don't always replant the trees. This makes CO2 in the atmosphere increase. Another thing that humans do is 
they burn some of these, these trees and that also releases CO2 into the atmosphere. So as trees are burnt or decay, CO2 is released into the atmosphere. The increasing CO2 causes glo global warming and the enhanced greenhouse effect. So the increased CO2 causes global warming and the enhanced greenhouse effect. It's not all bad though, because humans are also trying to capture some of the, the CO2 in the atmosphere in order to reduce this using carbon capturing technology. So humans are trying to capture some of the CO2 in the atmosphere to reduce this. All right, let's move to question two. Question two, microbiologists test strains of bacteria for antibiotic resistance. They do this by soaking paper discs in antibiotics and placing them on bacteria growing in petri dishes. The paper discs in the center of petri dishes E and F in figure 2.1 have been soaked in penicillin. And if you notice, there we have the paper discs here. We have these zones, a small zone over here, a big zone over here that look clear. And that's where there's no bacteria growing. And the white area, that's where the bacteria are growing. Okay. A, state the type of mi microorganism that produces penicillin. So the type of microorganism is a fungus. So it's fungi that produce penicillin. B, state and explain the evidence from figure 2.1 that suggests that the bacteria in dish F are resistant to penicillin. Okay, so we need to state that the clear zone in ditch, dish E is larger than the clear zone in dish F or the other way around. And now we need to explain it. And the reason why is because the penicillin is not killing the bacteria. Okay, the clear area around the disc in dish F is much smaller, so the penicillin is not killing the bacteria. The stating the reason is because of the saying the clear area around dish, the discs in dish F is smaller, and explaining the reason the penicillin, the penicillin is not killing the bacteria. Okay, C1. Explain how bacteria become resistant to antibiotics and how humans can reduce the problem of antibiotic resistance. This is a pretty big question. It's out of six marks, but there's lots and lots and lots of points you can put down, but you have to put some points down about both of them. Okay, so first of all, the bacteria have mutated, and because of that, they have a gene that's resistant to the penicillin. The penicillin doesn't cause a mutation though, it's just the bacteria have mutated. So the bacteria have mutated, so they have a gene resistant to penicillin. Okay, and what a mutation is, it's a change in the DNA sequence of the bacteria. So a mutation is a change in the DNA sequence. Okay, so bacteria with this resistant gene survive and they reproduce, and bacteria without it do not reproduce. Okay, so bacteria with, resistant gene, with the resistant gene survive and reproduce, and bacteria without the gene do not reproduce. All right, so bacteria that survive pass on their, this resistance to their offspring. And this is the process of natural selection. So bacteria that survive pass resistance on to the offspring. Okay, so the reason why they, this happens, this natural selection happens, is because exposure to the antibiotics acts as a, as a selection pressure. So exposure to the antibiotics acts as, as a selection pressure for this natural selection. So what can humans do to reduce antibiotic resistance. So we can reduce antibiotic resistance by only using antibiotics when it's essential that we do. And when we do use antibiotics, we have to complete the full course of the prescription. So humans can reduce antibiotic resistance by only using antibiotics when essential and completing the full course of a prescription. Okay, and other ways that humans can reduce antibiotic resistance, we can uh, isolate patients with, with that are infected. So we try to minimize the number of people who get sick and we can improve health care, sanitation, nutrition. We can create new antibiotics. There's a whole bunch of things that you could put down here. Okay, so humans can isolate patients with infections. Humans can improve health care, sanitation, nutrition, etc. Humans can develop new antibiotics, which is a difficult thing to do, but we're working on it. And if you notice, that is a lot more than six marks there. Okay, there's a few important things. First of all, write your answers in bullet points. 
and then it's easier for you to see how much you have and for the examiner to see how much you have and easier for you not to just start rambling on and repeating the information. When you answer this, there's a lot of extra marks you could get here. Try to put down as close to about six as you can, but make sure you have some. It says in the question, how can, uh, how do they become resistant to antibiotics and how can humans reduce the problems of antibiotic resistance? So make sure you have some points from both, but that's way too many points. You'd waste too much time if you answered that many points. All right, two, explain why viral infections cannot be treated with antibiotics. And the reason for this is because well, the antibiotics work by attacking the cell wall of the bacteria, the peptidoglycan cell wall. Viruses do not have this cell wall. They're also not alive. Okay, so they just don't work on viruses. So viruses do not have a cell wall. So some bacteria and viruses cause disease, but many are useful to the biotechnology industry. Explain why bacteria are useful to bio in biotechnology. Okay, so bacteria are very small. They're much easier to grow than say pigs or mice. They take up a lot less space and they reproduce very quickly. They can often multiply every 20 minutes in ideal conditions. So bacteria are very small and reproduce quickly. They also contain plasmids, which are very small circles of DNA. So they're much more easy to manipulate. So bacteria contain plasmids and genes can be inserted into the plasmids easily. Well, certainly much more easily than they can into the chromosomes. So genes can be inserted into the plasmids easily. Another reason why they're useful in biotechnology is because the gen genetic code of bacteria is exactly the same as the genetic code of all other organisms. So they have the same genetic code as other organis organisms, the same A, C, G, and T as everything else. Okay, and they can still make very complex molecules, even though they're very simple. So they can make complex molecules. Okay. Okay, question three. Figure 3.1 shows a photomicrograph of a section of a root. All right. Now, if we look at this, we have J, that's a xylem. Um, K is actually the phloem harder to see. It's slightly different to what you might see in your textbook, but it's still in about the same spot. Okay. L is the cortex and M is a root hair cell. All right. So A, structure J is a xylem vessel. As I said, that's this one right here, the big hollow ones in the middle. The xylem vessels conduct water from the roots to the stems. State the features of the xylem vessel that enable them to conduct water. Okay, so one of the key things, xylem have no cytoplasm or organelles. They're hollow. Okay, the, there's also a lot of pressure uh, as the water moves up the xylem. So the cell walls are, are thickened with lignin. Xylem vessels are very long cells, kind of like a straw. And they are waterproof cells and they have pits in the sides so that water can escape to where it needs to go. And the end plates between the vessels are perforated. That means that it's, it, it doesn't have the cell wall at the end to stop the water. It's like one straw on top of another straw with a little sieve in the middle. So xylem have no cytoplasm or organelles. The cell walls are thickened with lignin. They are very long cells. They are waterproof with pits for water to move between vessels. And the end plates between the vessels are perforated. Okay, again, more than three marks. So you have a little bit of wiggle room there. B, describe the pathway of water from outside the root to the xylem vessel J at the center of the root. Use the letters in figure 3.1 in your answer. Okay, all right. Okay, so the water goes in through the root hair cells. It goes up, it goes around, it goes either between or through the cortex, sometimes along the cell wall, sometimes through the middle, and it goes, it has to get through K, although quite often it doesn't necessarily go through the phloem, and goes into the xylem vessel. All right, 
So that bit means it goes from M to L to K to J. All right. So water enters the root hair cell M by osmosis. Okay, so water enters the root hair cell M by osmosis. And that's because the soil has a higher water potential than the root hair cell, so the water moves from higher water potential to lower water potential. Just describing osmosis, really. So the soil has a higher water potential than the root hair cell, so water moves from higher water potential to lower water potential. Okay, the, re the way it's able to keep it so that the soil has a higher water potential is that there's active transport of ions in the, within the cell to create a water potential gradient to make it so that there's there's always less water inside the cell than there is outside the cell. So there's active transport of ions to create this water potential gradient. Okay, and then we can say the actual path it goes, water moves through the root cortex. It goes from the root hair cell to the cortex, then to the phloem, which is K, and then into the xylem. Okay, water goes from M to L to K to J, that's the root hair cell to the cortex, the phloem to the xylem. All right, let's move on to C. C, scientists wanted to determine the flow rate of water in roots. They measured the flow rate in three zones of onion roots as shown in figure 3.2. So zone one is near the end, zone two is in the middle, and zone three is at the top. Okay, and you have onion sitting in a jar of water. So they measured the flow rate in healthy roots and roots that have been treated with a toxic solution. The results are shown in table 3.1. All right, so we have our healthy roots and our, un and our treated roots. Not a huge difference, but there is a difference. Okay, so calculate the percentage increase in the average flow rate between zone one and three for healthy roots. Give your answer to two significant figures and show your working. So first of all, we have to see how much it's increased. So it's increased, okay, increased by 280 minus 150, and that equals 130 arbitrary units. Okay, and then we need to see our percentage increase. Okay, and that equals 130 arbitrary units divided by 150, that's what it started with, arbitrary units times 100 to make it into percent. And the answer you get is 86.66666%. And it says, give your answer to two significant figures. So that is 87%. All right. Two, the scientists observed that the xylem vessels near the root tip were narrower than the xylem vessels higher up the root. Describe how the width of the xylem vessels in different zones of a root affects the average flow rate of water. Use the information in table 3.1 in your answer. Okay, so when it says use the information in table 3.1, you actually have to specifically use some of the information. Okay, so the first thing you, you might notice is that the nearer the, to the tip of the root, the lower the flow rate. And this flow rate increases as you move away from the tip of the root. Okay, and that's for both healthy and for treated roots. Okay, and you might see that the flow rate is greater in zone one in the treated roots, which as it's a toxic solution that was put in, that sounds kind of surprising. Okay, but it's lower in zones two and three in the treated roots. All right, so let's write that in. So first, the nearer the tip, zone one, the lower the flow rate. So the flow rate increases from the tip to the bulb in both the healthy and the treated roots. So flow rate is greater in zone one in the treated roots, and the flow rate is lower in zones two and three in the treated roots. Okay, so that's four bits of information there. You need three, you should be okay. And three, suggest why there is little difference in the flow rate in healthy roots and in roots treated with the toxic solution. Okay, so the solution may be toxic, but xylem vessels are dead cells. So it's not really that much of a problem for the xylem vessels. 
Since island vessels are dead, so solutions have no effect. Also, water flows in by osmosis, so they don't rely on living cells. So water flows in by osmosis, so it doesn't rely on living cells. All right, that's it. Let's move on to question four. Four. The eye is a sense organ that responds to light. Figure 4.1 is a diagram of a section through the human eye. A. Table 4.1 describes some of the functions of the parts of the eye. Complete the table by naming the parts of the eye and using the letters on figure 4.1 to identify the parts of the eye. Okay, so let's first of all name the parts and we can find the letter to, to match that, that, that matches the part. So, the part that carries impulses to the brain, that is called the optic nerve. Okay, the part that focuses light onto the back of the eye, that is the lens. The part that controls attention of the suspensory ligaments, that's the ciliary body. You might know it as a ciliary muscle. Okay, and the tissue that detects light and color, that's the retina. And the place where the location of most of the cone cells, that's called the fovea. All right, so let's look for those on the figure. Okay, so Y is the optic nerve. Okay, X is the fovea. W is the retina. Q, that's a ciliary body or muscle. R, that's the suspensory ligaments. S is a lens, T, that's the iris, and U, that's the cornea. There we go. Let's enter those in. So the optic nerve was Y, the lens is S, the ciliary body is Q, the retina is W, and the fovea is X. All right, there we go. B1. A pair of muscles in the eye work in opposition to each other to adjust the amount of light entering the pupil. State the term that describes the action of a pair of muscles working in opposition to each other. Okay, muscles that work in opposition to each other, they're known as antagonistic muscles. Okay, and they're the same with any muscles. And in the eye, they work just like they do in your bicep and tricep. Two, a different pair of muscles in the eye work in opposition to each other to view objects at different distances from the eye. State the name of the process that allows the eye to view objects at different distances. Okay, if you want to focus on things close up and far and then far away, you that requires accommodation. C. Explain why the eye cannot easily identify different colors in low levels of light. Okay, the reason why the eye can't detect colors at low levels of light is because colors are detected by cones, and cones need more light. The rods work in low light, but rods don't detect color. They just help you see in low light conditions, the black and white. Okay, so cones detect colors and are less sensitive in low light, and rods work well in low light, but can't detect color. D, some people inherit color blindness and cannot identify certain colors even in bright light. The gene responsible for color vision is located on the X chromosome. There are two alleles for this gene on the X chromosome. We have X big B for normal color vision and X little b for color blindness. One, people that are heterozygous for color blindness are called carriers. So they can pass on color blindness to their offspring, but they are not color blind themselves. They're normal themselves. So state the genotype of a heterozygous female carrier. Okay, well, first of all, we start off with female. For it to be female, it needs to be XX. Heterozygous means different, and you always put the capital first, so big B, little b. All right. Two, there is no gene for color vision on the male sex chromosome. State the genotype of a colorblind male. Okay, for a male, you have to have 
x, y. Okay, and for color blindness, there is a little b, but there's nothing for y. So it's x little b y, and that's why males are more likely to be color blind because they only need one gene. Females need both of them, both of them to be color blind. Figure 4.2 shows a pedigree diagram for color blindness. Okay, so we have circles are for females, squares are for males. If they're a white circle, they're normal. White square, normal. If it's a dark circle, they're colorblind females. Dark square, colorblind males. And if it's half and half, they're a carrier. But if you notice, there's no carrier males because you can't be a carrier male. Either you're colorblind or you're not. You can't just carry the gene for a male. Three, person 13 in figure 4.2 is male. That's this person right here. Okay, his parents are seven, person seven and person eight. Use the key to complete figure 4.2 by drawing the correct symbol for person 13. Okay, so looking at this, that figure, person 13 is male because it says so here, and males are all square. Okay, now the dad, he, he's normal, so his, his genotype is X capital B, Y. The mum is colorblind, so she is X little b, X little b. Okay, this one, this, this boy has X, Y. The Y came from the dad. It doesn't matter if he was colorblind or not because it actually makes no difference. But the mum had a 100% chance of giving him a colorblind gene. So this boy is colorblind because his mom is colorblind. All right. Four, color blindness is a sex linked characteristic. Explain why females four and five are carriers, even though their mother is not a carrier. Okay, so this couple here had five children. All right, so the mother is non color blind. She's, she has normal color vision. So she had, her genotype is homozygous dominant. All right, and the father had to have obviously one recessive allele on the X chromosome. So the mother donated a capital B to all of her children, a non-colorblind allele to all of her children. But the father to the boys donated a Y which makes no difference whatsoever to color blindness. And to the girls, he had to donate a color blind allele. All right, so both of the girls were color blind, even though none of the brothers were and the mother isn't. So one chromosome is from each parent. The father passed on the color blind allele, so all the female offspring are heterozygous. So X capital B, X little b. And it doesn't ask anything about the, the male children. All right, that's your two marks. Question five. The liver is an important organ in many processes. A, the liver responds to changes in insulin concentration and insulin is a hormone. One, define the term hormone. So a hormone is a chemical substance that is produced by an endocrine gland. It is carried by the blood and alters the activity of specific target organs. So a hormone is a chemical substance produced by an endocrine gland. It's carried by the blood and alters the activity of specific target organs. This is a good definition to know. They like to ask this question semi-regularly. Two, describe how the liver responds to an increase in insulin concentration. When insulin is in the blood, it stimulates the production of an enzyme called glucagon. Glucagon converts glucose into glycogen. Glycogen is stored, it's a storage form of sugar, glucose, and it's insoluble. Uh, insulin also causes the increased uptake of glucose by the liver cells. Okay, insulin stimulates en enzyme production. Enzymes convert glucose to glycogen. Glycogen is stored and it's insoluble. It causes the increased uptake of glucose by liver cells. Okay, that's four points for two marks. So just put down a couple of them. B, the liver is also involved in the processing of amino acids. 
One, describe how excess amino acids are broken down. All right, amino acids are broken down by a process called deamination. Amino acids are broken down by deamination, removing the amine group. Okay, this forms urea. It does this because part of the amino acid is converted to ammonia, and then that is converted to urea. Okay, part of the amino acid is converted to ammonia, which is converted to urea. Two, state the name of the process that assembles amino acids to form proteins, and that's called protein synthesis. Okay, protein synthesis. C, the liver is also involved in the processing of toxins. One, lactic acid is an example of a toxin that is produced during vigorous exercise and is processed in the liver. Describe how lactic, lactic acid is processed. It's just saying, describe how lactic acid is removed from the body. How is it changed to, what, to something else? Okay, so lactic acid is processed by aerobic respiration. And aerobic respiration uses oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water. This process uses enzymes and lactic acid is converted back into glucose. Okay, lactic acid is processed by aerobic respiration. It uses oxygen to produce CO2 and water, uses enzymes, and lactic acid is converted back into glucose. Obviously, that's four points for two marks, so you should be okay. Two, alcohol is another toxin that is processed by the liver. The effect of alcohol consumption on the risk of dying from liver disease was investigated in men and women. The results are shown in figure 5.1. Okay, the results from the men are the solid line, and the results, results from the woman are the dotted line. So describe the results shown in figure 5.1. Okay, so describe. It doesn't want you to explain them. It just wants you to describe, to describe them. It probably also wants you to quote some data points. So as we can see, um, as the alcohol consumption increases, the risk of dying from liver disease also increases for both men and women. And you can see that it's a similar trend in both males and females. However, the line for males is exponential, or the line for females is not. When it's at low levels, the line for females, it actually shows that, it's, that women have a higher risk of dying from liver disease than men. But when it's at high levels, men have a higher risk of dying from liver disease than women. Okay? At 112 grams per day, there is the same risk. So here, there's the same risk of dying from liver disease for both men and women at 112 grams per day. So as alcohol consumption increases, the risk of dying from liver disease increases for both men and women. And you can see a similar trend in both males and females. It's not the same though, because the men have an exponential curve while the women do not. At low levels, at low levels of consumption, females have a higher risk. And at 112 grams per day, there's the same risk for both males and females. And what it says, use basically use the figure, use the, a graph the information from the graph, you can generally get a point for quoting some data from the graph. So choose a point. So at 140 grams per day, men have 60 arbitrary units of risk, while women have 46 arbitrary units of risk. So for the data quote, you can just choose something. I chose the very end. You can choose maybe the part where it's the biggest, not choose the very beginning or where you've already quoted this bit right here. That's, that's an important point. That's not just a data quote. Okay. So you can generally get a mark for quoting it, a specific data point. In, in full using the units. Six, young mammals that are orphaned can be bottle fed. Figure 6.1 shows a newborn tiger cub sucking on a bottle. A1, sucking is an example of an involuntary action observed in newborn mammals. State the name given to involuntary actions. So involuntary actions are known as reflex actions. Okay, and two, describe the advantage of breastfeeding compared with bottle feeding. Okay, this is just saying, describe the advantages of breastfeeding. It's not comparison. You're not saying disadvantages of bottle feeding. You're not saying advantages of bottle feeding. It's just advantages of breastfeeding. And there's lots of things you can put down. Okay, breast milk contains antibodies. Well, bottle feeding doesn't. It allows bonding with the mother. It is at a suitable temperature, body temperature. So with bottle feeding, they have to heat it up. Some people use the microwave and that's a 
big no-no because you get pockets of really, really hot, hot milk. And if you don't heat it up enough, it could be too cold. So it's at a proper temperature. There's less risk of infection. You don't have to go through the process of sterilizing bottles every time, making sure that every everything is perfectly clean. Okay, you can say it's convenient or it's always available or that there's no preparation. Those are all about the same mark. It's free or it's cheap. Well, it's not actually free. The mother needs to eat enough to make sure that she's producing enough good quality milk. But if the mother already has a balanced diet, it's free. If the mother doesn't have a balanced diet, then she has to pay a little bit more so she can get a balanced diet. It's easy to digest. Some infants find it difficult to digest the formula. There are no additives in breast milk, so there's less risk of allergies. The volume is controlled, so it's less likely to overfeed. The, basically, the, it's controlled by how much milk the mother has and how much the, the infant wants to drink. Okay, so the nutrient requirements are met as the age changes. So a newborn infant needs colostrum, which is, has a very different nutrient balance compared to milk as the child gets older. And even as they get older, the fat and the nutrients contents change. It's actually quite interesting, really. So that is a four mark question. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten marks. Don't write down all that. You'll run out of time and you'll probably irritate the examiner who just wants to mark four marks. Okay. So there's plenty of things to choose from. And now we're on to the last page. B, the digestive systems of young mammals are not fully developed. Enzymes such as amylase, maltase, and protease are often added to baby food to aid chemical digestion. One, complete table 6.1 by stating the substrate and products for each enzyme react reaction. So remember the substrate is what it starts with, the products are what it ends with. So amylase, it starts with starch and it ends with glucose. You can say maltose as well. Okay, maltase, it starts with, starts with maltose and ends with glucose. And protease, it starts with proteins and ends with amino acids. All right. Two, suggest why the temperature of baby food must be controlled when the enzymes are added. Okay, so enzymes are obviously very sensitive to their optimum temperature. They work best at their optimum temp temperature. When the temperature is too high, the enzymes denature. And when the temperature is too low, you don't get as many reactions. So high temperatures denature enzymes, low temperatures mean fewer reactions, and enzymes work best at optimum temperature. And last, three, state one other condition that must be controlled to optimize enzyme activity. I'm going to say the pH must be controlled. Okay, you could also say the enzyme concentration or the substrate concentration. All those are good. Okay, I hope you found this paper useful. If you did, please press the like and subscribe buttons. And if you have any other questions or comments, we'd love to hear them in the discussion section below. And have a great day.